Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. Um, my name is Alain Vidal. I'm working with the CGIR uh, system office in Montpellier, based in France. Um, Long-term engagement with CCAFs, the climate change program of CGIR on many aspects. Um, and I'll be uh, these events moderator today. Uh, I hope we'll have a few more people coming soon. Uh, we have at least one of our speakers we hope will join us, but uh, like many of us, she's probably experimenting train delays this morning. Uh, sometimes comforting to come to Germany from France where trains are used to be late and realizing that it's not only in France. <laughs> So this morning, we are uh, together to on the first, I would say, technical event for this Agricultural Advantage series of events organized by uh, CGRC CAFs, uh, focused on what we call the gender advantage uh, and looking at gender responsive adaptation in smallholder agriculture. The two objectives for, for this event, we would like to share lessons on uh, integrated gender in adaptation projects with smallholder farmers, which could serve as guidance to those who will implement adaptation measures uh, in agricultures and probably beyond. And we'd also like to uh, set a research and action agenda for further work in this area. It's also an important thing and for us CGIR understanding what the needs are, what the obstacles are uh, before setting a research and action agenda is key. Um, so I'm going to moderate a women-only panel this morning, uh, which would balance uh, with another event I was uh, last month on, where we were only men and one female moderator, uh, which I say, don't tell my boss I'm on this panel because I should not accept to sit on a panel which is not gender balanced. So don't tell my boss today. I hope he's not watching, but I know he's meeting with our donors in Colombia these, these days, so he won't watch. Uh, and it's too early in the morning for him from Colombia, so I'm, I'm safe, but uh, <laughs> quite happy to, to be with you here today, and, and thanks to the organizers. Um, and, and, and just uh, as a joke to start with, uh, I'm, being one of the French male in an organization which tries to be gender balanced, most of my female Anglo-Saxon Anglo colleagues consider that French men are uh, macho and not re respective of gender. Uh, that's, that's the image we have. So they usually change their minds when they know that I'm at the head, if I may say so, with my wife of a family of 13 people. Uh, five kids and three grandkids plus the uh, partners and so on and that's seven women and six men in this family so we are doing quite well in terms of gender balance so far one granddaughter and two grandsons for the next generation and and i think my granddaughter is watching uh today if if it works <laughs> uh, and she doesn't understand english but that that should be fine <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me introduce uh, our speakers of today. Uh, and so we'll understand you will come to here and after we'll sit on the other side on the panel. Uh, our first speaker will be Ilaria Fermian. Uh, Ilaria works with IFAD, the uh, UN International Fund for Agricultural Development. Uh, she is the Environment and Climate Knowledge Officer and she will uh, speak to us uh, about the IFAD program on adaptation for smallholder agriculture programs and how this is focused on gender benefits for adaptation investments. It's a huge investment made by IFAD uh, thanks to its uh, funders, donors, and, uh, and, and it's important to, to look at what's the gender dimension into that. Um, next will come Tonya Rowe, who works with CARE, um, CARE is a major uh, NGO and she will present, uh, well, uh, Tonya is uh, the gender and social inclusion leader. Uh, she's not only worked on climate, she's also worked on migration, uh, I understand. And I know we know that's an important aspect of what happens with climate change. 
Uh, Tonya is the global policy lead, food and nutrition security. Um, Priscilla uh, at Chakpa uh, is the national coordinator, uh, Water Supply and Sanitation Collaborative Council in Nigeria. But she's moreover the executive director of the Women Environmental Program, and she would be here representing the group of African negotiators uh, and where, where she has the lead on the gender issues. So an important voice uh, for us, especially if the negotiators are busy with other meetings this morning, to have someone who uh, really is part of that negotiation. And uh, last but not least, hoping she will join us, uh, Sophia Heyer, uh, who is the gender and social inclusion leader for uh, the CGIR, um, CCAS program, research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security. Um, and we'll have another speaker for the conclusion remarks, but I'll, I'll get to her after. So uh, without further delay, uh, Ilaria, please. Okay, so good morning, everyone. I think, um, yeah, we are, I think we are all aware of the gender advantage in agriculture. Uh, according to FAO, for example, uh, we know that uh, if women were given access to the same resources as men, um, the agricultural output in developing countries could increase uh, by up to 4%. Always a great into FAO, we know that if we were able to respond to gender needs uh, around adaptation, uh, we could reduce the number of hungry people uh, in the world by 12 to 17 percent, and more in terms of um, uh, project uh, impacts. I heard recently a study from CARE, where uh, a study on land recuperation, where we could see that uh, if uh, women we are given the lead on the process, they could do the same work uh, as uh, uh, done by men leading the process with only 18% of the, the cost. So, um, I mean, I, I think uh, that, uh, that we have clearly what the advantage is in terms of uh, project impact uh, and outcomes. And in addition, uh, we also know that gender advantage related to transforming relationships between men and women to unlock uh, women's potential in terms of confidence and decision making. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, in IFAD, as part of its mandate uh, of uh, eradicating rural poverty, has always attached a lot of importance to gender equality and women's empowerment uh, issues. And this, uh, this works as well uh, whenever we deal with projects with the climate adaptation objectives. Um, the IFAD approach uh, on gender equality and women's empowerment is based on its policy. The last uh, revision of the policies dates uh, 2012 and uh, the policy has uh, three uh, main stra three strategic objectives the first one uh, relates to economic empowerment uh, so mainly it means uh, uh, promoting economic empowerment to enable rural men and women to have equal opportunities to participate in and benefit from uh, economic activities the second objective relates to decision making and representation and uh, relates to enabling uh, women and men to have equal voice uh, and equal influence uh, in rural institutions and in rural organizations. And uh, the last objective of the policy relates to equ equitable uh, workload balance, um, mm, at trying to achieve a more equitable balance uh, in workload and also in the sharing uh, of economic and social benefits between uh, uh, women and men. 
So all uh, IFAD projects uh, are basically at formulation stage, uh, they are checked uh, against the consistency with those objectives. There is a, a quality en uh, enhancement process uh, through a series of steps uh, by which projects uh, are used by the technical team according to these uh, to the policy objectives, and if they don't respond well, they are sent back for revision and, uh, and so on. Um, however, since uh, the objective of today is really to share lessons on integrating gender in adaptation projects uh, with smallholder farmers, I want to share some of the concrete actions uh, that are uh, undertaken in this sense uh, in the IFAD's Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, or ASAP, uh, that we have already been mentioning a couple of times also yesterday. And uh, um, basically, the, there has been a review of the uh, ASAP uh, design projects, and I think some of the copies are uh, distributed in the room. It's called the Gender Advantage, just like today's event. And uh, um, we, we show some uh, of these uh, different uh, types of action. So bear in mind that I'm still talking about uh, project design and formulation stage. So first, uh, let's say sectors of action, I would say it's the one that builds on women, uh, women's knowledge and experience. Um, Basically, uh, we try to integrate in the project uh, uh, vulnerability analysis uh, to assess uh, the vulnerability of livelihoods uh, of different gender groups. Uh, and also, um, we try to use, uh, in the, I mean, to integrate in the project design uh, um, some uh, participatory approaches, especially to develop uh, adaptation plans. Uh, and. Uh, I mean, there are different types of participatory approaches that we use. One uh, that is quite common in the IFAD project, for example, is participatory mapping. And uh, we really believe uh, that uh, the importance of, in, in the importance of those processes as much as uh, the resulting adaptation actions, because normally with participatory approaches, uh, we can really build uh, the capacity of communities to work together and uh, analyze their own risk and found, find uh, their own uh, solutions. Uh, another area which is quite common in the adaptation projects uh, is the promotion of equitable access to adaptation knowledge. Um, we all uh, know that, uh, that women farmers are left out of many forms of communication channels uh, that are normally critical to their ability to adapt uh, to a changing environment. And this may be due to, to work burden, to social norms, uh, to literacy, education levels. Uh, and uh, at best, uh, this means that they are potential to contribute uh, to household and community response to climate change is not fulfilled. And at worst, it can also result in much greater vulnerability and especially to extreme weather events. So uh, we tend to have components in the IFAD climate adaptation projects uh, where we provide access to both climate information and early warning, and uh, we build uh, the capacity of women uh, in, uh, in this sense uh, in, in many ways. Uh, sometimes also IFAD projects uh, uh, specifically target uh, investment to women uh, because we know that women face a serious gap in accessing productive resources such as land, uh, credit, uh, water, technologies, knowledge, as we said before. So um, we try to give, uh, to give access, uh, for example, to um, credit for income generating activities, to agricultural inputs, uh, and I mean all, uh, all activities that can uh, provide opportunities for them to diversify their livelihood. And um, one thing uh, that is quite common is the selection now of value chains, uh, both for their climate resilience, but also for their appeal uh, to women or for their relevance to women's business. Uh, and we notice that uh, when we do that, uh, often there are also positive outcomes in terms of nutrition, which is an important co-benefit of, uh, of actions related to gender. 
another uh, areas uh, another area which is uh, integrated in the project uh, is uh, related to the issue of workload we know that climate change uh, um, increase uh, uh, women's workload especially with what relates the time uh, needed to gather uh, water and fuel and um, Many more and more if the ASAP projects uh, integrate uh, climate smart technologies uh, such as biogas. This is an example from an ASAP project in, in Mali. And uh, also rainwater harvesting uh, that uh, normally reduce uh, the time for women for um, fetching water and fuel so that they can uh, uh, mobilize time to contribute to livelihood uh, diversification strategies and sometimes also to balance uh, uh, time uh, with uh, to, to balance the, the men's workload <laughs> uh, timing. Um, so I was saying that this is mainly what we have uh, in uh, in project design. Now the challenge uh, goes when we try to implement all those actions, and I would like to share an experience I just had two weeks ago. I was in Mali for an ASAP. Uh, co-financed project South-South Exchange. There were eight projects from West, uh, Western Central Africa plus uh, Djibouti and Madagascar, so all with this uh, co-financing from ASAP. And uh, we had one day fully dedicated to gender training, actually with the support of CARE, with the facilitator of CARE training people. And um, all those projects, they have, uh, they have been checked uh, against their, their consistencies with uh, the IF agenda policy objectives. They have, uh, they have a gender plan integrated. But most of them uh, brought up uh, three main issues they are still uh, facing. The first one relates uh, to, to capacity. I mean, uh, they, they were insisting on the fact that it's not only an issue of, of training project beneficiaries, but also the project implementation teams, they always often lack capacity on gender. And uh, uh, I just want to remind that IFAD works with the governments, and I mean, we, we do the design and the supervision of the project, but the projects are implemented by governments. And um, these, uh, these appear to be a, a big issue in terms of uh, the, the governmental teams involved in the project implementation. Uh, we are raising the fact that uh, not, I mean, maybe there is a gender focal point where's the capacity, but overall the project implementation team often uh, uh, lacks knowledge and capacity on this. The other point is that there is a general perception of uh, the fact that uh, um, gender equality and uh, gender equality and women's empowerment is like perceived like as a tick the box thing, whereby we we have to comply. But they do, there is not a clear evidence of the, the um, impact, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, addressing uh, gender issues has a positive impact uh, in, in the project uh, as such, uh, so that there are better outcomes, better results. And uh, our project, ESA project teams were saying that they need more evidence for that also to, to convert <laughs> um, the, the people around them. And the other thing is that we always integrate in our designs a lot of, uh, of tools. I mean, there are many tools that exist. IFAD uh, is quite familiar with the use of household methodologies. Uh, there are a lot of vulnerability assessment tools and so on. But then uh, the project team say they also need capacity to use those tools. They are there, people are aware that these tools exist, uh, but the actual implementation of the tools in the project uh, is still uh, a bit challenging. Uh, so th these are more reflections directly taken from the project teams, uh, but mm, we last year, uh, actually, we IFAD commissioned CARE and together with CCAFS a study on an assessment of how uh, se selected ESA projects uh, are translating the project design commitments into practice. Uh, and uh, that review identified uh, both opportunities and challenges, mainly focusing on the areas of uh, women's participation, project opportunities available for uh, both men and women, capacity building, and uh, project cycle management. And this is, uh, let's say, what the, the topic of next presentation, which will go more in depth uh, into this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ilaria. We have a bit of time for questions. We'll have 
discussion with the panel after, but if there are any question for understanding, clarification. Yes, Danush. Micro is coming. On what the priority should be. But just looking at the room, you know, we have different stakeholders. We are from development organizations, NGOs, uh, countries, research organizations. So in terms of those recommendations, can you sort of break it down into the different roles that we... Yeah, EFAD would have a different role. So just if you could... Yeah, I, I definitely think that it would be useful uh, for like, thinking about CCAFs and other research uh, uh, institutes to look uh, at the, those linkages between uh, gender equality, women empowerment and uh, project impact. Uh, always, uh, when we talk research, we always talk applied research. <laughs> so, I mean, we, we know, I think, this is uh, in this room, <laughs> at least, uh, we all have the same approach on that. But really looking uh, at how project activities uh, done with the gender lens uh, um, bring uh, this uh, increased project impact. And uh, at, at least uh, listening to the project team, I think this is something where there is a need for more... Uh, work to be done and more evidence. So this is definitely an area uh, for research, I would say. And, um, and definitely this should be also linked to capacity. Um, I, I think, uh, um, I mean, thinking from the IFAD's perspective, uh, there is a reason for we, we started working with CARE because I don't think uh, that we have uh, uh, a solid network of trainers, for example, in the field, and this is something uh, we should start to develop more and try to, to, I mean, partner more with organizations such as CARE or other NGOs who are more present in the field and can provide this kind of support at national level. And uh, uh, yeah, I realize, for example, also on the use of tools and this doesn't want to sign a, a criticism <laughs> not to if I do a seek us, but a lot of our tools are in English. We were having this workshop in French-speaking Africa, for example, and we realized that, that people are a bit cut out of this, uh, uh, of, I mean, the possibility of using those tools simply because the material is not developed in French. So I think there are also many small actions that we can take uh, to improve on that. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that the teams on ground are interested to get information about the impact it makes if you in involve women more directly into the programs. Is there any strategy of EFAT to make sure that this impact, this additional impact, I would say, is really counted and looked after? Yeah, we, we have, uh, I mean, I think more and more compared to the past, uh, we, we have a series of, of core indicators that we use to, uh, it's, a, it's called the, the Result and Impact Management System at IFAD level, so for a sort of corporate uh, um, aggregation of results, and we have a series of indicators that also look at gender aspects, including workload, uh, uh, women's empowerment. Uh, uh, so let's say again, the system is there. Then specific projects, they may have also their specific indicators that are captured, but sometimes depending on the project we face challenges in, uh, in the actual uh, <laughs> measurement on the ground, which I, I guess it's a common issue. But uh, at least uh, there has been a recent effort uh, to, to build uh, more of those indicators in the, in the corporate system. Okay, thank you, Ilaria. Uh, another round of applause for Ilaria, and we'll, <laughs> yeah, we have to move on, but keep your question for, for the time for the panel. Uh, so our next speaker is Tonya Rowe. And Tonya worked with CARE, as I mentioned, and she will actually present, I understand, the review that CARE made of this ASAP program and the gender mainstreaming. So once the tech is fixed.
Great. Thank you, Alain, and thank you to CCAPS and other partners for having CARE as part of the panel this morning. And thank you all for joining us this morning, including those who are joining us online. As Ilaria mentioned, um, CARE conducted with CCAPS a review of EFAD's ASAP program. Um, and that was really intended to see how the commitments that have been made in EFAD's approach to gender equality and women's empowerment, how those were really being translated into project implementation in order to really contribute to what we would call gender transformation. We hear about gender sensitivity, gender responsiveness, but ultimately what we really need in order to achieve gender equality is full-on gender transformation. By gender transformation, ideally what we mean is actively seeking to build equitable social norms and structures in which women operate and the relations that they have, not just within their households, but communities, as well as at a national and a global level. And then even beyond looking at equitable social norms and structures, it's also then about addressing individual gender equitable behavior. And by being gender transformative, it's ideally to address what we might call the gender disadvantage. So in conducting the review, again, it, it was intended to be a very practical review so that we could see how this is really being translated into program implementation and the impacts that EFAD wants to see through the ASAP program. And then it also, from that review, informed a how-to-do note. And most of what I'll talk about will actually be um, the content of the how-to-do note. But first, to highlight a few of the key findings of the review of the ASAP program, as Eladia mentioned, part of it really was there's a strong emphasis on women's participation, which is incredibly important, but it also needs to go a step further to ensure that there's also a focus on women's access to the opportunities in the project. And th that access can be limited by social norms. It can be constrained by a women's labor burden. There was a recognition in the review that a lot of the projects were very aware of the different practical needs that men and women have, but then projects were often designed to be accessible to women in terms of their existing roles, um, their existing mobility, or their domestic and home-based livelihoods. So it was then potentially reinforcing some of the roles that women are playing. There was, in turn, then a limited focus across the projects in uh, focus on gender dynamics and how those dynamics really shape men's and women's different vulnerabilities to climate change, as well as their different capacities to adapt. And then finally, not all of the projects, but a number of them did also have gender focal points. And those focal points were really able to serve to ensure that the gender action plan was mainstreamed in implementation. So there was a lot of value in that, but not all of the programs or projects had a gender focal point. So after that review, we, we took a step back and then worked again with, with CCAFs and EFAD to develop a how-to-do note. And that built on the review findings and was intended to provide very practical advice for any practitioner on how to develop a gender transformative program. And again, there's a little bit of a, an overview on the slide of gender transformative. I'll summarize a few of the key points from the how to do note. You have an advanced draft on some of the chairs in front of you as well. Um, but we do expect that it'll be published and then available on FAO and EFAD's websites in the next few months. So one of the first areas that we looked at was understanding gender and social norms. And really understanding those norms is important for understanding how they govern an individual's adaptive capacity. And that's then a first step in designing a gender transformative program. And that means really looking at three things. First, risk, vulnerability, and capacity. Understanding how men and women and girls and boys experience climate change differently because of the roles that they play, because of the access to resources that they do or do not have. That then enables, in, in project design, it enables identification of the best ways to build adaptive capacity for different populations in a household and community so that those interventions really target their individualized needs. It's also about looking at household decision making and being able to support women's roles as equal decision makers in households. 
that enables them to be empowered to fully benefit from other interventions in a program, for instance, the adoption of different agricultural practices. Because that then means that women are also, with their male partners, able to decide which practices, how they adopt them, and then also to voice their needs that enable them to then adopt those practices. And the third is taking a really hard look and addressing the labor burden that women carry. Women have a dual labor burden of both unpaid farm work, often being responsible for their household's food security, so cultivating the crops and the food that their family eats, but then they also have a very heavy domestic care burden. And being mindful of that labor burden is critical because of the focus on also ensuring women's meaningful participation. There's a need to ensure that adding that participation is not just adding to their labor burden. And a couple examples of how CARE has looked at one or more of these um, issues within gender and social norms is our gendered climate vulnerability and capacity analysis, a very participatory tool for working with communities to identify what vulnerabilities they see, what impacts they see, and the things that they believe need to be addressed to enhance their capacity. And by doing that in a gendered sense, not only are you getting direct information from communities of how they perceive their own vulnerabilities in their own context, but you're also ensuring that you are tapping what women see as their vulnerability versus what men see. Because given different gender roles, they might be quite different. Another example of, of a tool that we have used in programs to look at women's labor burden is to work with men and women in a household to do a clock exercise to sit down and say, well, where does each, of, each hour of my day go? And women are able very much to tell you where every single hour of their day goes. And it raises awareness within the household and the community, not just of how many hours women are working, but of the intense labor burden that they do carry. And it then provides an opening for a conversation within households and communities about a different sharing of that labor burden. Another issue we looked at in the review was how to tackle women's very unequal access to and control over resources. Because transforming that is very critical to begin to address some of the systemic discrimination that we see that shapes women's access to climate information, to land, to education, extension services, technology, inputs, and financial services. And as Eladia also mentioned, that unequal access really shapes how women can adapt, and if we were to address it, it would very much shape how we're able to address global hunger. We know from FAO, not just on the, the 12 to 17 percent reduction in hunger, but that's up to 150 million people who would not be chronically hungry if we simply addressed the unequal access to resources between men and women. Again, to give a concrete example, um, in CARES Pathways program, over the course of the project, we've been able to mobilize women's access to 11,000 acres of land, which is half the size of Manhattan. And that's been done through very rigorous gender dialogue at a community level between men and women, but also with community elders and chiefs who are looking at allocation of land. So it's a very deliberate conversation about current dynamics and about what those dynamics mean for communities. The next was then um, picking up on a, a focus of um, EFAD's ASAP projects is the planning and decision-making process. Given unequal power relations and marginalization in communities, vulnerable groups, youth, and women are often excluded from what can be very top-down decision-making. And when it, those decision-making processes aren't inclusive, it means that their perspective and their needs may not be met because they're not actually being voiced. Whereas if you do include all of those different groups in a very inclusive decision-making process, it better informs service delivery because you can make sure that your interventions are meeting different populations' needs. It means that it's more responsive then to their needs, but it also includes their knowledge because the communities that we work with know best the context in which they live. So for them to be able to say, you know, this is the context that we're seeing, these are the barriers that we're facing, these are the incentives that would work for us, 
it ultimately means that you're reaching the needs of a broader set of people. That then does have to work in tandem, as I mentioned before, with gender dialogues that promote women's participation, but also address that unequal labor burden so that women are not just having an addition to their labor burden. There's also then a role for policy to play in this process because it isn't just decision making and planning at a household or community level. It really is also about decision making at a national and a global level ensuring that local, national, community level policies or policies here within the UNFCCC reflect the needs of small scale food producers, women and youth. And a lot of that is about ensuring their participation in the process itself. Finally, in any program you come full circle and you make sure that you have a robust monitoring evaluation and learning program. This also is something that can be gender transformative. That means that you're engaging communities, women and youth, in the process of reflecting on the project itself. You may work with the community in a participatory fashion to develop indicators of what kind of change the community is looking for. That's particularly important as we think about adaptation because different individuals' needs and adaptation are different and adaptation needs change over time. An adaptation we've often talked about is as much a process as it is an outcome because you are grappling with consistent change and figuring out how you access the resources from decision making to financial services to inputs to practices that actually enable you to adapt in that process. Having participatory and gender responsive monitoring evaluation and learning also empowers local stakeholders to continue to voice their needs so that they're able to say this worked for me this didn't how can we change this let's think about some new ideas and by that you have a continual learning process as you go either to the next stage of a program or as you design the next project itself and one example that we've done for this within some care work in terms of a tool is a participatory performance tracker this is something that can be used throughout the life cycle of a program and it's sitting down with the community to look at all the different practices or behaviors at an individual household community level and seeing which households have been able to adopt those practices and which haven't. And when you see that a household is perhaps lagging behind on a number of the interventions that are being talked about, there's then an entry point to figure out what's happening in that household that's creating an obvious additional barrier so that you can make sure they are also able to adopt a lot of those practices with their colleagues. Ultimately, my time is over. Um, ultimately, it, it does come back to investing in program capacity, ensuring that gender analysis is your first step, making sure that you understand what the barriers are, what the context is. And then it's also figuring out what is your action plan based on that analysis so that you're working with communities and with households to make sure you're targeting interventions at the different barriers and the, the different dynamics in the context. And then having that gender focal point ensures that you have someone who is making sure that this moves forward. We've also seen here in the UNFCCC in the Lima work program on gender, there is a focal point. And that really is designed to help move everything forward. So it's also about that broad-based program capacity. And I'm happy to take any questions. Just to remind you, if you have questions, to introduce yourself before asking a question so that we know who you are. Presentation. I'm Luna Bharati. I work for IMI. And um, in a lot of the countries where we work, uh, there's this there's feminization of agriculture. I mean, this is what we hear a lot. It's also because of migration, men move, you know, this rural to urban migration. So the role of women yeah. in agricultural processes is really changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and but 
When I listen to all these talks on gender, I don't see them address this very important social change that is happening. And you know, how you know, have you integrated this component into your study as well? That's a terrific question because the dynamics are very much changing. Um, we see that in, you know, in a lot of countries, women are about 43% of the agriculture labor force, and in some countries it's growing because there are a lot of these dynamics. One thing I, I didn't mention, which is sort of mission critical for doing any kind of gender equality and women's empowerment work, is the engagement of men and boys. So that you're working with not just women, but also with the men and boys in the community to talk about dynamics at all different levels. So that if there is out migration by men to find work in cities, there's an understanding of what that means for women when they're left behind. It's also important then that all of this work sit in the context of a more comprehensive approach so that it isn't just about agriculture. It's also about diversifying a family's livelihood. It's about ensuring that they aren't just dependent on agriculture so that there are other options perhaps at a community level other than migration if the head of the household doesn't want to migrate. That was something um, a number of years ago, you mentioned the work I'd done on migration. It was an eight country study where we looked at changing rainfall patterns, the impact of food on food security, and then resulting human mobility. And there was very much an awareness that people don't always want to migrate. They do because they don't have other options. So in addition to addressing gender dynamics, it is also about ensuring you're addressing broader rural development and making sure there is a diversity of options available. Thank you. Um, I like your presentation very well. Thank you. Very practical. Uh, my name is Priscilla Chapman from Women Environmental Program and WSCC, also African Working Group on Gender and Climate Change. I just have one um, issue that has been bothering me. When you talk of climate change, I mean information, um, most of the times how we communicate climate change to the rural women, mm -hmm. not just the rural women, but to the farmers generally, has been a serious issue because uh, we find it difficult to go and talk about climate change. What is climate change? What do they understand by climate change? Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to understand how you deal with these issues. Sure. Because as African Working Group on Gender and Climate Change, we would like to learn some best practices mm -hmm. from you on how we can move on this issue. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your question. Um, there is one tool that I actually forgot to mention. Um, this was not a planted question either. Um, there was one tool I forgot to mention that is about ensuring communities have access to climate information. And it's a participatory scenario planning. And it's an approach that brings together local governments, local communities. So it does need all, also to be a gendered approach. It also brings in um, meteorologists or local scientists as well as local NGOs to talk about scientific projections for the seasonal forecast as well as local projections based on more traditional knowledge of how they anticipate the season's weather will go, as well as basic perceptions. And I often try to, to make the reference for people who aren't necessarily thinking, well, do farmers use local perceptions? Well, when I decide whether to wear a coat in the morning, I usually look out the window or I stick my arm out the front door because you make decisions based on what you perceive. And so it brings communities together with the scientific community so that there's a sharing of knowledge back and forth, and so that there's a co-design of actions to address different scenarios. And that way, there's a much more participatory nature in designing those plans. And then there's also a participatory nature for designing how that information is disseminated to communities, whether through radio, whether there's access to ICT, whether there is contact with different church leaders. So, and we've seen in some of our programs that the uptake then of those scenario, those actions and scenarios has gone from 30% roughly to about 70% because communities have a lot more confidence in the actions because they help design them. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tonya, again, for your presentation. So our next speaker is Priscilla Achekpa. You introduced yourself already by 
asking a question. So, uh, and you will share with us the experience of the, I understand, the African uh, group on uh, climate and gender. And I think a perspective from the ground. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Permit me to appreciate SICAF, particularly for inviting me to speak at this event and to share um, what the African Working Group on Gender and Climate Change is doing in Africa. Well, uh, first and foremost, African Working Group uh, on Gender and Climate Change bridges the gap between science and policy in gender and climate change as well as accelerate implementation of gender responsive climate change policies and financing. We also try to coordinate and provide leadership uh, in Africa's engagement in the regional and global gender and climate change processes at the United, I mean at the UN C, but also at the African level with the, with the AUC. Uh, we try to also look at how we can draft and submit African position on gender and climate change to the SBI and also working with the regional bodies uh, such as the ECOWAS, uh, the COMESA, trying to provide information to them on how they can engage positively on issues of climate change. Uh, so far, some of the activities that we have been able to undertake is to build the capacity of national policymakers and African group of negotiators to mainstream gender into national climate change processes and negotiations. And why did we do this? Because we discovered that there was a complete disconnect between the negotiators who are mostly male dominated to that of the female gender. And so we felt that there was a need for us to engage them at this level so that when we come for negotiations, we'll be on the same pace and not when the men will be talking differently and the women will be talking differently, including the youths. We also build capacity of women on negotiations and leadership skills to ensure that more women attend global and national decision-making meetings, uh, support African countries to develop gender-responsive adaptation and mitigation plans such as the NDC, SNAPS, CSA's framework. A couple of African countries at the moment have even developed their gender and climate change uh, action plans at the national level because we felt that if we are talking about I mean, climate change and you don't have a plan, to engage at the national level, then how do you engage at the continental level? So it's part of what the African Working Group on Gender and Climate Change is engaging the, the national focal points, at the, uh, I mean, to make sure that they have these plans. Because if you have your NDCs and you don't have a document that shows what plans you have for the gender, then it means at the end of 2030, you will not be meeting that goal, which is goal number 13. We also pri provide a platform to, to do to, I mean, for discussion on gender and climate change in Africa. Period to this, there was no platform. And we started this in 2013 when we discovered that there was really no platform. Most of the African women that come for negotiations, even at the UNFCCC or any part of negotiations at all, we just go there individuals or even as nationals. So there was no coordination point. So for us, we felt that it was very key that we begin to look at this issue. And as we're coming to, uh, to Bonn now, we come with one voice and not, I mean, and not just one voice, with a document that we can upload to the UNFCCC to see that this is the African women's position, but not just the African women's position, but also the African group of negotiators key into it. We also try to contribute to the engineering of uh, adaptation financing the various UNF uh, Triple C financing processes, including the least developed countries, as uh, funds, special climate change fund, adaptation fund, and newly established green climate fund, climate investment funds. Members of, uh, comprised of experts from national, we have members that are nationals, uh, government, civil society organizations, CBOs, academia, and also international researchers. And we are affiliated at the moment to the CAOSA. CAOSA is a conference of African head of states on climate change and youth program in Africa, which 
the, uh, the, the ministers and the African head of states came up with this and felt that it was an important decision that they needed to take to address the issues of climate change. So they have this particular program that addresses just gender and climate change within the framework of African Union. So why is gender mainstreaming for Africa important? Uh, well, gender mainstreaming itself is not an end, but it's a strategy. It's a strategy an approach and a means to achieve the goal of gender equality. Sometimes when we're negotiating, I know that as a negotiator, the African group does not want to hear gender equality. They always want to hear gender integration or gender equity because they feel that equality is a relative term and is generic and covers, it means a lot of things that is not acceptable by the African group of negotiators. So most of the times, we try to look at the issues of equity and also the, equi the issue of uh, integration. Gender mainstreaming in adaptation is based on the understanding that women and men have different life experiences, needs, vulnerabilities, coping strategies, priorities, and that are differently affected by climate change, just as Toya said in her presentation. Gender mainstreaming into climate change adaptation aims at overcoming existing gender imbalances in the society and improving resilience to climate change impacts. This I don't need to do more on, much on it because I know that it, the previous speaker talked extensively about it. Now the process of mainstreaming gender into climate adaptation in Africa, we have tried to look at how we can increase institutional capacity for gender mainstreaming enacting gender responsive policy program and project cycle, gender analysis in climate change adaptation, adaptation interventions for gender equality in climate change adaptation, sorry, yeah, and then gender responsive criteria in monitoring and evaluation. Then we have a specific checklist for promoting social commitment to gender mainstreaming into adaptation actions. And this we are doing it Although at the moment we have not covered the whole of Africa, but we are working with some countries and we are hoping that uh, in due course, of course, this we, is something that every African country will be taking upon. Now we have very good case studies that in terms of what we have done so far, that you, you could practically see. And uh, one of the case studies is the gender mainstreaming in Switzerland policies. Switzerland has made progress in promoting gender in alignment with regional and international commitments in providing equitable opportunities for women and men, boys and girls, at all levels, women empowerment and social justice. Switzerland enacted and implemented a national gender policy. And uh, this gender, this policy conducts capacity building for gender mainstreaming in all national and sectorial policies. At the same time, strengthening partnership with development partners, NGOs, and community leaders for gender equity and the empowerment of women and girls. Mobilizing at all levels for social transformation on gender issues and for the implementation of the gender policy. So what are the benefits of gender mainstreaming in, in Switzerland? We have equal and meaningful participation for women and men at all levels of programs. All leadership positions must be 50% women and men. That is the good thing that is happening in Switzerland now. Increasing access and control of productive resources, for example, laws that permit women to inherit land, which land is a serious thing in Africa. Women assessing weather information and agriculture inputs for, for sugarcane production. Case number three, which uh, number two, which comes from my own country, Nigeria. Uh, has to do with the aquaculture by coastal life initiative as an NGO and it talks about the issue of fishing community which has been threatened by climate change due to increase of sea stroke storm surge into the community in tourists and salt water intrusion. So with this um, Colleen identified women and children as the most affected by the changes in the, in the fishery. Men are not as vulnerable since they migrate to neighboring communities. And of course, in every situation where you have the climate-induced problems, they may migrate, but the women are left in those, in those communities. So they are the ones that bear the brunt of all these things. So this project tried to address some of those issues, and it has been very effective. Case number three, which is women-led energy platforms in Mali. And as you can see from this, these are some of the things that 
the women are doing with the energy and this provides uh, the time that they would have been wasting to go out in the field to look for firewood to look for so many things they are using this um, to, 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 to I mean uh, to generate some sorts of income for themselves but also um, it helps them the ratio of uh, dropout of school girls has been reduced drastically as a result of this project um, challenges of gender mainstreaming we have law representation of gender experts on the social making platform and that is the truth as we are here now we are we, the, the women representation at the negotiations are very few from african countries and it has been a, a huge problem for us and uh, so we are looking at how we can increase that uh, low appreciation of importance of gender mainstreaming in programs and projects programs focus on institutionalization of gender procedures policies and rather on outcomes, limited human and financial resources available for gender mainstreaming. Existing gender strategies are not informed by gender research and analysis. There are no opportunities that are out there. A lot of them, we need to do a lot of research to be able to tackle some of those things. There are also indigenous knowledge that can be enhanced from the African perspective. We know that there's a shift in gender analysis for, dis for dispositional to, re to uh, relational, institutionalizing gender mainstreaming ad in adaptation actions with tangible outcomes is also an opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Priscilla, for these vision and, and examples. Questions? I just got that beautiful text which says a country cannot transition to electric cars or build green infrastructure or fulfill the Paris Agreement on an empty stomach. Let's make the case for climate agriculture undeniable. We have to do that. We cannot build electric cars when our stomach are empty. Where is going to be the future of our children? We need, the women need to be supported in this regard. So. Any question? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I see that uh, recently we had a climate uh, water smart agriculture meeting in Accra where uh, a number of uh, project experiences were presented, and we realized that most projects are designed by the women as the number of states of the world. And basically, how the technology is promoted, for example, uh, as shown in the one of the slides, uh, the energy saving technologies or water infrastructure. Uh, aimed at uh, addressing the time poverty of women are not designed in a gender responsive manner uh, including for example the so-called drought re resistant uh, crops which are difficult to process and adding to the burden of women so how do you see the importance of really uh, ensuring that we have gender training the necessary capacity uh, project planning based on you know a framework which considers the equitable participation of women from the design into the monitoring phase so that we address we ensure that uh, women are not only you know at the recipient at the recipient end but they are also agents of change contributing to adaptation mitigation processes policy making process and also ensuring that the technologies are based on gender-based assessments thank you thank you very much um like i said the african working group on gender and climate change is working with the member states to make sure that some of those things are being incorporated but we're not just working with the member states we are also working with the partners the donors in every project we want to see how in from the design phase how gender issues are being captured not just how gender issues are being captured but how they are brought into to speak for themselves and the last week i talked about some of those things she she started that for every project to be successful 
and it's gender mainstream, the women have to be able to prioritize what works for them and what does not work for them. And that needs to be integrated into the project. Because if it is not, then at the end of the day, even before the project starts, it has failed. Because it will not receive the, 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 the full attention of the women or are they, I mean, the desired impact will not be there. So the women and gender, um, I mean, women and women, African working group on gender and climate change are working for now. We are doing a lot of researches to see what, begs, what works in every of the country. Because we cannot assume that everything that works in this country A will also work in country B. So it's not one fit, one cup fit all. We have to look at different strategies of ad addressing different countries and ad addressing different vulnerabilities. What might work in Nigeria might not work in Mali or might not work in Ethiopia. So we need to have a kind of research to be able to integrate all those things into it. Because if we don't do that, and we think that every project that we design must take a unique, I mean, a, 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 the same approach that we have used, we have we have, we have fed even before we start the project. For instance, if you come to my country and you want to do a project in the northern part of Nigeria, your first strategy will have to, do, to, to be how do you address the issues of patriarchy? How do you address the issue of the women, the, the, the Muslim women, that the men will not allow them to come out? So your first strategy will be to get the men to agree with you, you sell the idea to them, and you let them buy into this idea. And then you ask them to bring their wives, who will now sit down and listen to you. And then you will be able to design that project together. But you cannot use men to go and do this intervention. It has to be women. Because naturally, the resistance will be there for cultural and for religious issues. So there are different strategies that we must use for both project design, for project implementation, and for monitoring and evaluation. But what we try to do is that at the monitoring and evaluation stage, we try to get the communities themselves, the women themselves, to be able to monitor the project. Because they are part and parcel of it. So if the project fails, the project, first and foremost, is for them. It's not for the people that are bringing it. So we try to emphasize that this is your own project and you must own it. But at the same time, you must be able to contribute something to it so that it, you, will sh you will show ownership, either time, land, or anything. But you have to contribute something to show that you, you, are, I mean, you own this project. It's not when a donor or an NGO comes to come and put in money, and at the end of the day, you say, oh, no, this is not our project. It's their own project. It's indeed your own project. So how do you make it visible? It's important. Thank you again, Priscilla. And, and last but not least, hot off the train, Sophia Heyer, Gender and Social Inclusion Leader for CCAFs, who will set out a research and action agenda for mainstreaming gender and climate adaptation. Oh yeah, sure. I don't use it. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the the kind introduction. Um, <laughs> apologies for rushing in a little at the last minute, um, but I'm happy to be here. Um, as as uh, Alain said, I will be talking about the research and action agenda for gender mainstreaming. Perhaps not not setting the final concrete version of it, but I uh, look forward to your inputs on it. Um, this, uh, this kind of discussion that I'm about to give is a product of uh, some of the work that CCAFS has been doing around gender and social inclusion over the last few years, and as well a product of our discussions with EFAD and CARE um, through the, uh, on the ASAP program. So, where are we here? Okay. 
Um, so I'll open with this table. This is a version of the table that uh, is in the How to Do note. And what it is, it's a combination of the different approaches that all three organizations have in terms of our areas of focus on what we think are really important components of gender transformative agriculture adaptation. So um, I, you know, the, the first thing is roles, looking at gender roles, social norms, what is expected of women and men, what are socioeconomic conditions and so forth. And I know that the, this has been discussed already um, by CARE and EFAD. Um, they've also, I'm not sure if there's a, oh, here we go. Let's see. Do we have it? No, it doesn't work? Okay. Okay, all right. Um, as well, the bottom here, investing in program capacity, I know that's been discussed. So I'm going to focus on really the, the, the middle ones. Um, the importance of ensuring women's access and control over resources inf and information, and to take into account power issues um, and uh, between genders, but also in a community, and then monitoring evaluation. So um, in terms of resources, it's actually the biggest one. It's not necessarily you know, the most important, and I know there's a concern that there's been too much focus on technology for agriculture in relation to um, development, but I think we need to keep in mind um, as, as Priscilla was just saying previously, women really need to be consulted and have control over what they need to accomplish, what they want to accomplish uh, for their households, for their communities, for their livelihoods. And that includes um, the resources, technology, information, finance, credit they need to um, use use those different resources. So we're talking about equal access to agriculture and climate information. Also that women's information priorities are addressed. They may be different than men's and one of the cases I'm about to talk about will show that. Uh, they need equal access to land, water and forest. Um, they need to have access to market opportunities and equitable credit and finance. And sometimes access to market opportunity means ac um, good infrastructure so that they can take their produce to market. Um, but that's not sufficient, of course. And uh, uh, EFAN has just been supporting a very interesting infrastructure project in Bangladesh, which combined infrastructure development for market um, access and development and poverty reduction with um, livelihood um, programs for women to help them set up small and medium businesses in relation to the infrastructure. And then also, you know, use innovative farmer-led community-based approaches for capacity building for everyone. In terms of power, um, it's important to ensure that all decision-making processes, all consultative processes are inclusive, you know, that certain groups in a community do not dominate the access to, for example, an information session or a training session. Uh, sometimes there are gatekeepers. Uh, so there are different ways to ensure that all, t all groups within a community have access. Um, and then it's also really important to ensure equal representation of women in decision-making at different levels, in the household, in community organizations, and also in the national level, as we've just seen. And then finally, for monitoring, evaluation, and learning, there needs to be a consultative, interactive process of learning, identifying success factors, um, defining indicators, you know, what are we looking for in this project? How do we define success? Um, how can we benefit um, all the members of, of the community? So that's the overall. So let me just talk about a few examples from both CCAFs and, and ASAP. So the, let's see. Let me make sure I'm on the same slide. Okay. Uh, so the ASAP program uh, for the restoration of livelihoods in northern Uganda was a program to support, partially support uh, gender responsive group activities um, in access to rural livelihoods and with market linkages, thanks, and infrastructure. Um, one of the highlights, so it worked with uh, both women and men to provide a, um, access to extension, there's market skills and access, market access infrastructures. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this project was that it used the GALS methodology, which is the Gender Action Learning System, which is a household um, strategizing, mentoring, visioning approach to work with both, help both women and men work together 
to assess their situation, um, plan together, and decide together how they can accomplish what they what their their aspirations are. Uh, in this in this this was an interesting example. This is not actually a, a picture from the program, but it's a nice example of perhaps. Um, the combination of tasks working together, of, of women and men working together. But what they did find in northern Uganda, and I think this is true for many areas, uh, many post-conflict areas, was that there was an endemic kind of um, uh, endemic uh, presence of gender-based violence, and that that was inhibiting the um, successful achievement of the results of the project, among other things. And so that recognizing that this was something that needed to be taken into account as part of a market program or a livelihoods program um, a, a brought about a more productive added approach and, and way to um, support the women in the, in the program. The next one is... Okay, this will work? Okay. Uh, the second EFAD um, project here is uh, PAPAM uh, in Mali. And this is a very interesting project for women. It, there were two aspects of this. It, it was to support smallholder farmers to access information, tools, and technologies to help build resilience to climate change uh, and use agrometeorological information, such as forecasting, harvest, pest management, drought management. Um, and there was also a um, appropriate technology component with women, an energy technology component with women. So in terms of the information, this is a very nice example of the, of, and CCAFS has found this as well in, in its climate information projects, is that women need access information differently than men. Um, it's partly a factor of access to resources. Uh, in many countries still uh, around the world, women do not have access to mobiles, mobile phones at the same rate as men, and if they do have access, they may not necessarily have control of them. And uh, we see still globally a gender digital gap in terms of ICT. So that's one of the main problems for women to access climate information. Um, so there needs to be different ways to present the information um, so that women have access to it when they want it and do not have to take on additional time or activities in order to access it. So if they have to travel to access information, that will be something they put at the bottom of their list. Uh, if they are not allowed to attend forums where men are present, then they're going to need uh, women targeted information sessions. Um, CCAFS has found that sometimes, you know, just a public bu bulletin board is the best way to uh, present information or to go through synagogues at, or mosques or at churches or any kind of um, religious institution where women are allowed to congregate. Um, in, uh, in Macedonia, a while back, what they found was that even if the women were doing a certain agricultural task, the man of the family, the head of the household who was male, would go to the session and um, then pass on the information to the woman, you know, sometimes more effectively than others. So what they did then was they actually just put out public demonstration plots in the middle of the village with some of the women farmers who were able to do this and through informal conversation as women walked past uh, they were able to disseminate the information. So the other thing is that because women do different tasks in the household, they have different access to resources in the household, they need different kinds of information. So for example, even if uh, a man and a woman are both farming in the household, the um, family labor and the resources will be dedicated first to the male plot um, and then secondly when that's finished over to the female plot, so the woman's plot. So that means women need information about different kinds of weather. They may not necessarily mean, need onset of rainfall information. They may need cessation of rainfall information. They may, they may need more information about drought. And so there needs to be this recognition of that difference. Um, and. Uh, and as well, a, a project around technology, um, biogas and solar technology was introduced with the women in the, in, the, in the community, which really reduced their dependence on firewood and fossil fuel. So it reduced their time and labor, um, increased the de decreased the amount of money they had to spend on energy, 
which they use to, uh, and the increased time and, en and income they use to engage in income generating activities. So this was seen as, a, this is a very positive way to promote women's agency. So I have just a short period of time left, so let me just talk about technology for gender equality. Where do I point? Okay. Um, in one of the projects, um, women actually took on non-traditional roles. They entered the agribusiness sector. They were able to rent or use tractors, and they started to um, produce crops at quite a l much larger scale than, than, than before. And so the question is, how did that happen? Um, it's not clear yet, and I think that's one of the issues to be look for us to be looking at, but they had access to land. There was a, a, a community process to allocate collective land to women smallholders, and, um, a pair, and they were able to take advantage of the finance support and the, and the, the, the equipment availability to actually develop businesses. In these examples, we have two other examples of technology. On the left, we have laser land leveling, which is something that CCAFS uses and works with in South Asia. This, in, in our experience in India, is a male technology. And the reasons, it is, and why can the women not access the tractors here? Well, we're not exactly sure. One of the reasons seems to be is that women are not allowed um, or feel uncomfortable actually accessing the person who rents out the tractors. They have to send a male female, uh, member of the family to do the, to do the negotiating and, the, and the, the business deals with it, and it's also cost them a lot of money. But the other thing is, is that women in this part of the world, they, work, they don't work in the field so much. That's not their domain. Their domain is livestock. And so then I think in this question, this issue, the, uh, this region, the question is, do women need different technologies that will improve their livestock production activities, dairy, uh, rearing a livestock, or do they need support to be able to enter this domain? And so that's, you know, that's the, the, the thing. Now, unfortunately, my time is completely over, so let me just quickly run through the research questions, which I haven't got to yet. <laughs> so these, I think, are four moving research questions uh, coming out of some of these discussions, and I think probably what you've heard this morning. How do you encourage women to move into non-traditional roles and opportunities? What is the collection of services, uh, discussions, uh, community activities, uh, access to credit? What needs to change for this? How do you improve women's access to land? Even if, it's legal, if, even if legally they are allowed access to land, doesn't mean that customary law will allow this. So there is work interesting work on connecting up customary law with statutory law to act at the community level to actually uh, encourage um, use and access of land by women. Uh, that needs a lot more work. Rental, you know, work with community leaders, so, so forth. How to move women into more profitable value chains and to more profitable positions in value chains is also a critical issue. To ensure that women do not remain at the lowest poorly paid, um, most vulnerable position in the value chain. There really needs to be a clear set of um, strategies and, and support services. What are women's value chain priorities? Are value chains being developed in the areas that women are present and active? Um, and technologies, I think we've talked about technologies. Um, we haven't had, I haven't had a chance to talk here about women's organizations, but what is, women's organizations can be a great um, platform for women's empowerment at the local level. Uh, Self-help groups in India are one example, the Self-Employed Women's Association in India, but the revolving credit associations as well that we see all over the world. These can be really effective platforms for women to have a voice in their community, to have strength together, and to manage things like larger technologies or run larger businesses. Um, on the other side, what is women's role in Mainstream organizations, does having women in the leadership make a difference? How do we ensure that that happens? How do we get beyond the token women on the, le on the leadership committee? I've already asked, is climate information reaching women? Is it useful? Um, women's position in red meat value chains, I think, is one area of real interest in terms of sheep and goats rather than cows and maybe more than just managing dairy. 
And then as um, Priscilla was talking about in her last, in her um, presentation, what kinds of policy alliances, what kinds of policy capacity development and work can be done to integrate gender into policy at different levels and into how it's actually implemented um, at the ground level. So thank you for, <laughs> I keep doing the wrong one. Thank you for your time and uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, time for a couple of questions. Luna. Um, thank you for your presentation. This is more a reflection and comment rather than a question, but I'd like to get your opinion. I find that at the local level, uh, integrating or promoting gender equity, I mean, it's, uh, it's doable. There are lots of tools you can um, measure uh, the impacts, their indicators, etc. But as you move up the hierarchy, national level programs, then it d becomes just a tick in the box. Mm. And so, you know, how to, you know, yeah, go beyond this. I mean, that's a good question. And actually, maybe Priscilla is well um, situated to answer it. Um, I think that part of the answer is a really vibrant um, civil society, uh, you know, local organizations but also connected into national organizations that can keep the agenda, keep these items on the agenda and hold policymakers to account. Um, gender budgeting is also I think one way. And, and looking at it the other side, you know, there needs to be so much more capacity development done of policymakers to understand how important these issues are to them actually so that they understand it's not just something a token kind of set of actions that they're supposed to go through because that's what everybody's talking about now but that they really understand it's important for them to do their job properly and then they need to understand how they can do it so i think there's the understanding what they need to do and what can make a difference It's just like a contribution. Contribution for the panel time. Sorry, mm -hmm. that's just for questions. Okay, so okay. keep it for later when we have the panel and mm -hmm. have the microphone. Yeah. My, my question is, uh, I think uh, from your last uh, power slide, you say what kinds of policy alliance work to integrate mm -hmm. gender to policy at different levels. And I would say that uh, for me, an experience is uh, on the ground shows that we have a lot of gender policies. Honestly, we have the policies, but what we don't have is the action plans to bring the uh, policies into reality. For instance, in Nigeria, we have a good agricultural policy that takes account of gender and even went to the extent of doing some kind of a costed analysis of how much it will cost and things like that. But in terms of putting it into implementation and ensuring that there's the kind of synergy, yeah. you understand, uh, to bring in the women and to really actually focus on the aspect of the problems of women in terms of tackling all these things. It's not there. And for us at the local level, this is what we really want to see in terms of action plan implementation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I completely agree with you. I'm not, I'm not sure if I have anything more to add than what I said previously. It's like, uh, you know, the, there is a role here for civil society to take on these issues and I think in some respects some of these issues have been dropped you know the the gender kind of issues have are not seen to be agriculture so much as they are seen to be other issues and agriculture NGOs perhaps are not necessarily taking on the gender issues and so I think there needs to be this understanding of of the importance of this um, in light of the feminization of agriculture that's happening in many parts of the world but you know climate change is making agriculture so much more difficult this is going to be so much more of an emergency crisis issue that I think there needs to be this recognition that um, you know among all parties that um, action needs to be taken but I agree that in some in some cases, pol the policy is there. In many cases, unfortunately, even the policy is not there yet. But, um, but I, that's, I think that there does need to be action, coordinated action at all levels um, to really highlight the importance of this issue. Yeah. OK, thank you, Sophia. Keep your energy for the panel uh, <laughs> if you still have questions. So I'll now invite our speakers to join on the panel. 
and we will equip ourselves with the microphone. That's my understanding. So we have now a 20, 25 minutes for, for further discussion on that. We, we've gone from the implementation side with IFAD and the review made by CARE, uh, this testimony view from Africa and, and the research question raised by uh, Sofia at the end. So we've gone through the, this whole process uh, and we would like to uh, have a more open discussion. So there were question spending, I think in the questions that were raised to Sophia at the end, there was one question I had kept for that panel, which was really how do we move from, you know, ticking the box uh, approach to a real impact implementation, and that probably starts with the EFAT country portfolio managers, but also go with policy makers, as you mentioned, Priscilla, and, and of course that has to mobilize the civil society. Uh, so that's certainly one, one question we'd like to, to, to hear you about, because that's probably something you face on the day-to-day, -day, on your day-to-day -day work. I'd like to collect a few more questions uh, from the, from the, uh, the audience and, and, and then we'll have, uh, uh, ask the panel to answer. Yes, and remind, remember to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Fabian, I'm a student assistant at CPS. And I actually have a question. Oh, thank you. From, um, from the online audience, uh, and the question that was posed was, could any of the speakers tell something about the underlying reasons that women are more productive than men? And there were some <laughs> reasons given by other viewers, but I won't recall them because they <laughs> are a bit too uh, more uh, too stereotyping. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's one. <laughs> Another question, Danush. J just just so that I uh, because I have the mic here, but it's sort of following up on your comment uh, from before on on um, policies and maybe Sophia and uh, Priscilla can both address it. So yesterday we had the opening event for the Agriculture Advantage Series and uh, Bruce Campbell, our director, uh, he gave a vision for transforming the agriculture sector. And one of the key takeaways for me was that, you know, the solutions may not only be in agriculture, it could be in the other sectors. So, you know, if the, it's not just the policies in agriculture, but it could be policies in digital uh, mobile phones and so on, you know, which can enable change in agriculture. And Sophie, you have a background in technology, for instance. So what are the policy uh, aspects that we can focus on in other sectors in relation to gender for transforming uh, gender in agriculture? Okay. Uh, one more. The, I'd like to give the floor to those who have not, we have not heard yet. Hi, I'm from Conservation International in Guyana. Um, so my question, without diluting the focus on agriculture, is on um, how you talk about gender when you go into the communities and when you talk to partners. Um, because obviously you could talk about gender directly using gender te terminology, but you could also talk about social inclusion. And of course there are pros and cons of applying either terminology. Um, so it would be good to hear a little bit about how you uh, individually see that and how you go about talking about it in the communities, but also with partners. Okay, and um, maybe, yeah, a last question and then we have a first round. Uh, I don't know whether you've discussed this actually before I came in, but it's one thing that keeps bothering me. It's about how much are we investing in the female small-scale farmer on the ground in terms of the climate finance flows 
from the international system and how effective is this investment is really very important because when I look at uh, the fast start finance and what they said in terms of uh, balancing adaptation and mitigation funds if you look at the flows you find out that it's not balanced at all what was of course has flown into agriculture adaptation adaptation in agriculture it's so minute compared to what goes into mitigation so from the standpoint of negotiations here what do, do you really think we can do to do a lot of advocacy to let parties see that we need more investment in terms of financial flows to the small scale farmer and particularly the female small scale farmer like we have said they are very productive and we need them to be more productive then if we, they have to be more productive for us then it means we need to invest more in them not only investing more in them and making sure that that investment is effective yeah effectiveness of investment thank you so who wants to start well um i will start with the last question since I'm a negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will start with the last question. Uh, it's very interesting, the question that you have raised. Uh, but when it comes to the issue of negotiations, uh, every country or every continent have their own interests of what they want to see come out in the negotiation. And as I said earlier, perhaps before you came, we came in as African, particularly on the gender component. We have our own position paper, which we have submitted. As we go on to develop the action plans for the Lima Work Program, we want to see specific things come into that action plan. But you also understand that there are several other interests that are coming in. Now, when it comes to the issues of finance, I know that the African uh, head of states, particularly on the issues of agriculture, they had agreed that every country we at least uh, in their national budget make 10% the minimum for agriculture. Now, the question is, how many of the African countries have actually made these funds available? To the farmers. That is question number one. Question number two, as we come here, yes, we are talking about the issues of investment, climate finance, and getting into the uh, green climate finance fund is very technical. So technical that most of the African countries, if you don't have the capacity, you won't be able to assess mm -hmm. that fund. They've made it so difficult that only very few countries have been able to get or to have access to it. So those are the things that we really need to work on. I am not negotiating on the finance aspects, but I'm working specifically on response measures and gender. So for us in the gender team, we see climate finance as a critical issue if we are talking about bringing out women economically and otherwise empowerment that is one aspect that we really need to focus on and so our action plan that we are developing must bring in the component of how we can in, in, i mean empower women economically and otherwise and that means that the issues of finance the green uh, climate finance must also address the issues of gender as we move forward so those are some of the things the consideration that we are putting on but of course as a continent we are looking at that issue very seriously and we have specific people that are focusing on that but as at this moment i cannot say exactly what the position is but i know that this is one of the areas that the african mm -hmm. continent is taking up very broadly okay yes tony sure um i'll start with the question about how we talk about gender mm -hmm and whether we talk more about social inclusion. I think, as you said, there are pros and cons to both because if you talk about social in inclusion, you ultimately have to define what you mean. So you do ultimately come back to gender. And I think one of the most important pieces in talking about gender is enabling men to have space to talk about their gender identity and what the role is that they end up playing. We know that 
when we work with communities and households on gender and on their roles and on the distribution of labor and on who the breadwinner ultimately is, we've also found that there are men who are glad to see that they don't have to shoulder the burden as of being the sole breadwinner alone. That by actually having a partnership with their wives and both of them engaging in income generating activities, that it begins to shift that dynamic for them as well and that it can actually be a, a true partnership. And so it is really about creating that space so that there's a safe space for men and women to talk about gender. Mm -hmm. um, it's sometimes just a household conversation. Sometimes it's a community conversation. So there are a number of different entry points that we as CARE will use in trying to engage communities around gender. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the, the policy solutions in other sectors. Because you're right, it isn't just about agriculture policy. It's potentially about health policy. So women are able to access health services closer to their communities that address the comprehensive set of, of health needs that women may have. It's also about social protection policy. So that, again, coming back to the question about the impact of migration, out-migration of men on women, ensuring that the, there's a robust social protection policy in place so that there is a safety net for women who may be left behind and are then um, kind of a, a female-headed household. That ultimately, though, comes back to the need for different ministries to have the capacity and the mandate to talk to each other so that agriculture plans or nutrition plans or climate plans or gender plans are multi-sectoral so that they are taking into account that if we're trying to achieve nutrition outcomes, you also need to include the water ministry, the health ministry, the agriculture ministry. It cuts across a number of ministries. And I would say the same thing coming to the question about effective finance and the process here uh, within the UNFCCC, it's the same thing about not necessarily siloing the different tracks of negotiations. There's the Lima work program on gender. There are the ongoing finance negotiations. There are also ongoing negotiations on agriculture. And there's a need to ensure that there is a comprehensive look at what is being talked about, for instance, on agriculture within the UNFCCC. We've talked, we're not negotiators, we're a civil society, so we like to propose ideas. We've talked about the value of a work program that brings SBI and SUBSTA together so that there's a, an open-ended ability to talk about a vast array of issues within agriculture and food security. And that might also then bring in the focal points from different countries or the UNFCCC focal point on gender so that there's a really good conversation about how agriculture and gender are linked so that there's the potential for a conversation about gaps in finance for agriculture and that's also then an opportunity to talk about what makes finance for agriculture effective when it comes to issues of gender equality and how you make sure that any standards or criteria or good practices that are developed have a very strong gender lens um, in order to ensure that finance is effective. Okay. Hilaria? I, maybe okay. I, I want to bring one concrete example that relates to the policy solutions in, in different sectors, which comes from the project in Mali that was also showcased by uh, Sofia. And uh, in that uh, project, which is supported by the ASAP, uh, IFADESA program, uh, there is a component which is specific on piloting biogas. And uh, now, I mean, it started off as a small uh, activity. Then we saw in the first two years of the project it was very successful, so it was uh, scaled up already. And uh, uh, now part of the project activities is really to contribute to a newly developed national strategy on biogas. And I think it's interesting under multiple sec aspects. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of impact at policy level and uh, of course it's something that has a gender dimension to it although it's not uh, an activity that by the project was uh, was started off as a gender specific activity and actually talking a bit more now we we relate to it at um, household level uh, it's interesting to note how the biogas is perceived as a 
tool which is beneficial to the entire household. Men uh, are those who uh, basically benefit from the bioslide that, that is uh, uh, left from the biogas system and it's used in their field and women actually benefit more from the cooking side of it. And, uh, but it's interesting, when you go in the villages where, where we have been implementing it, I men like showing and presenting uh, the biogas uh, digester and explaining that this is their house or having it. Uh, but then uh, women are those who, when they talk about the benefits they got, they are really enthusiastic and they say we really managed to save time, we have all these health issues and so on. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting case because it shows uh, something which is not uh, presented as gender tick the box thing <laughs> but also i mean uh, as a general value and uh, and can uh, easily get to policy level for example and then i also wanted to give a contribution on the finance issue being if at the financial institution we really struggle with the with the um, assessment uh, of uh, investment, how much goes where. And uh, the adaptation for small old agriculture program for us is a good example because it's funding climate finance that go directly to smallholder farmers with uh, specific targets. Uh, I mean, yeah, initially it was uh, 8 million smallholder farmers. Now, because also the fund has been reduced, the, the target is 5.5 million and uh, it's supposed to be half uh, men and women. But then uh, whenever we deal uh, with other sources of finance, uh, we, we also struggle a bit in being able to uh, quantify how much goes uh, to specific activity, especially related to gender. The UN have a, have a sort of uh, compulsory tracking uh, of uh, gender budget, but it doesn't go down to the project level. It's more for the UN institution system. So I think there, there is a need to, to move a bit forward in that, to improve the tools we have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Gloria. Sophia, you'd like to? Okay, uh, maybe I'll just start with the, the gender and social inclusion um, question since that's my title. <laughs> and, um, so <laughs> I'm asked that question quite frequently. Um, I, you know, obviously, uh, what I say is I'm all for social inclusion as long as you disaggregate by age and sex. And then, surprise, surprise, you start to come up with gender issues again. And so, you know, they're so, they're so interconnected, it's really hard, I think, to distinguish between them. For example, um, we, had, we, did, we, had, um, we had a research project in Eastern Africa with youth on their access to climate smart agriculture. And we found some of the same, of course there are issues particular to youth, you know, they don't have access to resources, they are not necessarily decision makers in their households, so forth. However, um, we also found some of the same gender issues, which is that the male youth, when they um, got married and they took on their family farm, they would be the main decision makers, whereas the women would not be because they would be the wives and they would be taking care of the children doing the domestic um, chores. And so there's still that same breakdown. So I think we need to understand that all of these issues affect everyone in a community um, as well as race. And so I don't really have an answer for you as to how, how to promote it, but I'm all for saying, you know, inclusive, inclusive, socially inclusive, but as long as those disaggregations are part of it. Um, and they're not swept under the carpet, which sometimes happens. Um, on policies, that's a really um, interesting question, Danush. And, um, you know, coming from a little more of a, you know, IT technology for development background, um, you know, I think that there are some areas in some of the more tech-oriented <coughs> policy areas that could make a real change for women. One, in terms of um, ICT and mobile phones, universal access policies are critical for women as well as other groups in society. I would suggest that, you know, given the trends that still um, men still and, and young men still tend to have more access and more control or more ownership of mobiles and computers, that there really does need to be another look taken by policymakers as to targeted programs for women, even though that's sort of not as popular anymore because we have this private sector model for, you know, mobile penetration and all of that, it's still missing women and in fact the gender gap, the gender digital gap is increasing slightly um, from last year. So there's that universal access and still there still needs to be targeting of certain groups, 
you know, for women, of course, um, part, one of the reasons they don't use mobiles as much is because the information is not as useful to them. And, and you know, there needs to be a look at women as a market for mobiles. I know that some of the private sector has started to look at that to a very small extent. It's not a very high profit model and so there needs to be some kind of work with them to make them understand that there is actually profits in, in this smaller, smaller income, smaller increment market that if, you know, brought all together could be worth doing. The other area I think that um, could you, and MPSA for example is a great example of, of an IT based finance banking technology that women have really embraced and has been a really positive factor in supporting their livelihoods, increasing um, their, their, the well-being of their households. So that's been, that's a really um, positive model to move forward. Um, in terms of other areas, I'd say infrastructure policy is critical. You know, public transit, transportation that's affordable for women, both so they can carry goods to market safely and cheaply and affordably. And um, yeah, and so that they can do all the other chores that they need to do as, you know, picking up and delivering children to school, um, caring for families, doing the family shopping, um, taking family members to the hospital, you know, there needs to be a way for them to be able to do this without taking a lot of time, without putting themselves or their daughters or their children at risk. Um, and, and to be able to run a household and or a business. And the third thing I'd like to say about policy is that gender ministries are not usually involved with agriculture ministries or energy ministries or IT ministries, right? The gender ministry is seen as the health, the social development. And you know, I, we saw this when we, I was doing an analysis of uh, the INDCs last year where women were mentioned in national INDCs, it was in relation to the sustainable development policy, the social development policy, the poverty reduction policy, not in relation to these kind of harder policies where really there needs to be much more um, integration of, and, and the gender ministries need to understand these are important issues. It goes both ways, you know. Um, so so the, those, are my, those are my main comments on policy issues. Thanks. Thank okay. you, Sophia. I, I Sophia? just wanted to add on the issue of the policy. Um, I think Sonia has rightly put it. There's a complete disconnect between the ministries, the different ministries uh, at the national level without the Ministry of Gender. And sometimes you look at it, you think that maybe the issue of capacity also comes into this. Because uh, maybe there is no, uh, because of lack of coordination, um, the Ministry of Gender sometimes do not also have the capacity to be able to engage with other ministries. And the other ministries feel that, well, uh, that is their own. So there's really no coordination among the, the ministries. We recently had um, an interministerial uh, platform in Nigeria uh, discussing the issue of WASH. And it was quite interesting to note that among the ministers that came, they didn't understand some of them didn't even understand what WASH was all about. Mm. So it was very critical for us to begin to talk at that level. But before we went into having the interministerial, we looked at the directors and we had what we call technical team to be able to discuss so that they will now feed in the ministers what the issues of WASH was all about. And so we, we, we intend to sustain that unless we get into coordination, proper coordination among the technical issues, among the technical experts, to get the issues of policies, especially when it comes to agriculture and mainstreaming, it is going to be a difficult thing. Because there are policies that are there. But most of these policies are not translated for people, for the local farmers, for the rural women, to understand what these policies are. Because at the formulation of these policies, people are not involved. So the policies, the, 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 the dissemination of these policies is also not there. So people don't get to understand whether there are policies or there are no policies. And that brings in the issue of civil society and other stakeholders to use these policies to begin to create a lot of awareness and sensitize the general public with what has already been formulated. Because it's unless people get to understand these policies and know that they are in existence, it will be difficult for them to make use of them. 
I'm conscious of time and we have five minutes to go. Uh, so <laughs> thank you all. Uh, please a round of applause for, for our panelists. I had, a last, I had a last question, but that will be for the next one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to introduce Bimbika Sijapati Basnet, who is the gender coordinator and of uh, C4, the CJAR Center for International Forestry Research, and working also with the CJR Forest Trees and Agroforestry Research Program. Uh, I suggest in, in the interest of time, because we have to unplug us, we stay here and, and we, we hand you the, uh, are, you, are you speaking from there or are you speaking? I can speak from here. Again. Okay, you, you, don't, you don't have slides? No. Okay, so we, we, we're happy to, yeah, if you could please join us here for uh, your wrap-up remarks. Yeah, so I was just asked to make some closing remarks. Um, and uh, it was a real pleasure to listen to everybody. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentations. It's also very nice to hear different perspectives from you know, implementation, design, research, and also from um, negotiators' perspective. So thank you very much again. Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things um, that I like, that I would like to discuss a bit more, that need perhaps a little bit more reflection um, from my side. Um, so I would welcome some thoughts later on. Um, the first one that I particularly liked about, um, about the discussion was the coherence across the speakers. And you know, this, the start uh, from the IFAD presentation that there are you know, three um, issues that need to be considered when incorporating gender in program or project design, which was the issue of opportunities. That's how I understand economic empowerment. The other was the issue of voice and, inf voice and influence and in decision making at various levels. And the third one was the issue of unpaid care work. And, um, and, uh, and it, it's very, I, 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 um, I, I would say it's very timely to, um, to identify these issues and to really ensure that there, there is coherence amongst the gender and development and climate change community across these themes because as we move forward about sustainable development solutions, you know, from the, the field that I am in, for instance, there's a lot of discussion about forest landscape restoration, there's a lot of discussion about Red Plus. How do we ensure that these themes are addressed in both safeguarding women's rights, but also talking about what kind of opportunities they might provide moving forward? The other discussion that I really liked was uh, uh, on the question of men and boys and how do you ensure that gender isn't something that's reflected in silos. Um, and then the third part was that you know, we, we really need to make a concerted effort not to to ensure that gender issues is not left to the poor woman in the global south or in the local community, but that there is this broader enabling for framework from um, cross-sectoral policies to different actors um, to ensuring that there is a sort of coherent framework, a consistent approach to supporting gender. Um, then uh, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm st I would say I'm still a student of the vast and growing body of literature on climate change. But one of the things that I was particularly interested in, which is coming out from the recent literature on climate justice, is this idea of risks and how there's a real discrepancy between the way in which risks are, are not, not perpetuated, risks are, are perceived at the IPCC or the global level, about you know, 1.5, about sea level increase, and the disjuncture between that and how local communities and individuals perceive risks. So I really appreciated um, CARE's um, approach to sort of bridging that gap um, in a very concrete and practical way, so that was very interesting. Um, then uh, other sort of other reflections. Um, uh, w one, one was the question that was um, discussed quite a bit about how do you, um, what, uh, how do you ensure that you know, well-meaning policies, um, you know, for instance, there's been quite a lot of um, advancement in uh, promoting gender progressive policies with regards to land, for instance. I'm 
um, from South Asia, and that's one of that's one of been the high high marks or the highlights of of uh, progress on that front, and the implementation of these policies. And quite interestingly, you know, um, in South Asia, both in India and Nepal, um, uh, women now have um, entitlement under law to have equal rights to inheritance. But actually, uh, recent research that's coming out is showing that um, uh, there's been very, very, very limited um, progress in terms of actually women claiming that right. So what is the issue? A um, lot of people say it's an implementation gap, but also a lot of people say it's because women themselves don't claim it. And even if they know about it, they don't claim it. And that, that is because of, you know, complementarities in relationship at the household level. And the fact that, you know, there are these wide range of social changes that are happening, that means these complementarities are even more important. Um, exit is a more difficult issue. Fragmented families are a persistent challenge and how to maintain that is a, is, is a issue and is a concern in many people's lives. So, um, and, and from that note, a lot of researchers have been talking about gender, not in terms of division or difference between men and women, but also in terms of complementarities and looking at gender as part of a wider social relationship, sets of social relationships of mutual, um, what do you call it? mutual understanding, mutual relationships, rather than as separate and distinct. And what does that mean in terms of the work that we do? Do we really start from that point of view that as soon as you look at gender, then you have to talk about difference between men and women? So that's one part. The second part is, you know, um, I attended some of the climate change um, negotiations as an observer yesterday. And what was really interesting to look at was that within developing countries, there are so many different, um, what do you call, um, different groups, small island developing countries, G77 plus China, and so many other relationships, so many other groups. So maybe what we need to do in terms of moving research forward is actually to talk about what are the wider social change. You mentioned feminization of agriculture, but there are very different manifestations of feminization if you compare it to South Africa, I mean South Asia versus Sub-Saharan Africa. So how do we bring in more nuance and more contextual approach to our gender work is where I wanted to leave. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Well, thank you all for attending. Thanks for your uh, contributions. Thanks to the panel and, and our final speaker. Uh, I hope you have fruitful discussions, conferences here. Wish you, wishing you a, a good day. Thank you.